Do you want me to get you some? Not right now. <laughs> All right, guys. Welcome back to the second Urban Sensor Hack Hangout on Air. We are uh, broadcasting today with uh, a couple of really fantastic uh, expert makers, as well as, uh, as Stuart Gaines again. Uh, as you can see, we've got uh, Emily Gertz and Patrick DeGiusto. Emily is an environmental journalist. She writes for uh, Pop PopSci, Popular Mechanics, Rolling Stone, Scientific American, and others. Uh, Patrick is one of Make's book editors, also an author. Uh, he writes uh, also for Wired, Popular Science, New Yorker, Atlantic, and they have both co-authored a couple of fantastic books, uh, Atmospheric uh, Monitoring with Arduino, Fantastic title, and then the uh, companion book, Environmental uh, Monitoring with Arduino. So for those of you guys who are watching, uh, I know we mentioned this uh, last time, but uh, to reiterate, the, uh, the Urban Sensor Hack program that we're doing, these, this multi-week program, we're inviting different hackers and groups, hacker spaces, maker spaces, to uh, collaborate and participate in this great program. Uh, if you go to our, uh, our landing page, makezine.com, slash urban hyphen uh, sensor hyphen hack, you can find a, a sign up where we will send a, uh, a selection of different sensors and, uh, and books that you can then use to work on a variety of projects. The only obligation is that you share these projects with us through our Google Plus and Makezine channels. So the, uh, this is all, the, uh, the, the, the main thing that we, uh, that that we'd like to do is uh, is get everybody participating in what types of things we're uh, we're doing with these urban sensor hacks. And uh, real quick, what I'll do uh, before we jump into today's program, uh, let's take a run through real quick uh, of some of the things that uh, we are sending out. Uh, there's a few slots left, so uh, for those of you guys who, who are interested uh, and you want to participate, make sure to 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 go to that landing page and. Uh, and, and, and register yourself. Uh, as I mentioned, Atmospheric Monitoring with Arduino uh, is one of the books, uh, as well as uh, Make Pocket Reference, the Make uh, Getting Started with Internet of Things, uh, O'Reilly iOS Sensor uh, apps. apps with Arduino. Oh, yeah. Alice Dare's book, uh, as you guys who watched the, uh, the Hangout a couple days ago, you saw Alice Dare, he had a fantastic uh, presentation. You can find that archived on the site, uh, and also the Make Electronics book. But the real good stuff are uh, the electronics that we're actually going to send, including uh, the ulti Make Ultimate uh, Microcontroller Pack and uh, Kip Kits, a uh, whole selection of wireless sensing uh, sensors and uh, and projects that you can do from Kip Bradford, who will also be participating in the. Uh, urban sensor hack uh, program here uh, in an upcoming hangout. Um, some of these uh, there, there are some of these kits will be included uh, with some of the some of the packages that have already been sent out uh, for the first round of registrants. The uh, future registrants, those of you guys who are trying to get signed up today, uh, we're going to include the the stuff that we've got now. But there there may be a few components that uh, you have missed out on. So. Sorry for uh, not getting you guys uh, everything. But uh, let's jump in and let's get to uh, let's get today's Hangout started. Stuart Gaines uh, has uh, a long-time DIY editor, has some words uh, about Urban Sensor Hacks and, uh, and, and today's project. So, Stuart, why don't you go ahead and jump on in? Uh, thanks, Michael. I'm going to try and do a little screen share. Hopefully that will work. Um, So, all right. Looks like that's coming up right there. And okay. So just go ahead and click yeah. So the full screen button, I think, uh, up in your top corner there, and that should that should take over the whole the whole the whole page there. Is that working for you? Because I uh, see it. I see it now. Nope. Oh, now it's gone. On our end, we can see... No, no, it's gone. You're not seeing it on your end? Patrick and Emily aren't seeing I'm it, not. but... Stuart, if you can if you can click the button in the top right of that window, uh, it should be able to pop right up. This one here? The one that looks like two arrows at a diagonal. 
and try to get that full screen. So as he goes through and, uh, and gets this lined up... Uh, well, this, this, one, this is actually a pretty swift presentation, so I think if you can see it in the window, it's, yeah. it's probably adequate. So, okay, let's go for it. So we had a, uh, we had a, as Mike said, we had a fantastic presentation by Alistair Allen uh, two days ago, and um, there were a couple of lessons that I heard that I really thought we'd bear repeating at least once, at least once more. And uh, you know, one is what is the reason for why we're doing these things, and the other is you know, really what is what do we mean by urban? And uh, uh, Alistair appended. Uh, onto the make mottos, his own modification, which is if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. And I think that's a, that's a really interesting justification for almost any urban sensor hack that we might do. And then the other thing Alistair did, and the thing I'd like to repeat a little bit, is, is just to uh, examine what do we mean by urban. And uh, if you think about what is urban, um, I think that's the beginning for the projects that you guys might be starting. So at one level, uh, you know, urban urban for most people is a busy street with a lot of cars and pedestrians and motorcycles. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just repeat, if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. So how might this be measure, measured is an interesting question to think about. Urban is also buildings. You know, buildings sort of define what we mean by urban. And Alistair uh, had a very interesting observation last Tuesday, which is, when you're measuring buildings, you're also there's also the possibility of measuring what's inside a building, and those are often really ignored by common sensing, you know, co common sensing observations that are done by government stations. And then thirdly, there's a green dimension to there's a green dimension to urban living, and the green dimension is almost different from what we would. Uh, think of as you know a natural setting. It manifests itself in many different ways, and people would like to know what is the contribution of urban greenery to the environment. And then fourthly, <laughs> and we're going to learn a little bit more about this today from Emily. There's a water. There's a water component, and uh, this is a picture of the Gowanus Canal in New York City. Actually, it's a picture from the EPA Superfund site report. And uh, it looks a little pristine when you look at it this way. Uh, but really, what's going on there is, is a subject of great inquiry. Um, and uh, just today, in today's New York Times, there was an article about this. And uh, this is uh, an article that I picked up today in today's New York Times. It says, as cleanup plan is set for Gowanus Canal, violations continue. So it looks a little different when you turn your eyes and look in a different direction. And for those of us in the, uh, on the chat who aren't really familiar with the Gowanus Canal, I uh, also pulled a little map of it up from, from the EPA report. This is the canal as it extends through Brooklyn on the left. And then on the right are the series of environmental reports that the government has commissioned. And uh, in there, I highlighted the water sampling field, um, which is uh, dated February 11th. February 2011. So the most interesting, the most relevant piece of data that the government's using to talk about its cleanup is more than two years old. I think that's interesting. Uh, so those are kind of the things that we're going to talk about doing here is, is, is trying to measure things using sensors. Sensors measure stuff and then trying to apply that to the urban envir environment which almost all of us live in. So without further ado, I'm Pleased, really, to introduce Emily and Patrick. Uh, this is uh, this is a cop. These are shots of the books that you're going to be getting if you're signed up for the pack. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to them. Great, thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, are we visible? Because I still see. Yeah, the books. Come on in. There you are. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick DiGesto. And I'm Emily Gertz. And we've written uh, two of these books. Uh, the first one, the first one chronologically, was environmental monitoring with Arduino. Uh, we followed that up with atmospheric monitoring with Arduino, and we are actually at work on a third book, which is just called environmental sensor. Just sensor networks. Just sensor sensor networks. 
Yeah. And it's uh it's sort of it's not a how to, it's sort of a um the white paper, you know, what's going on in the field of sensor networks around the world. So, yeah, this is a, a pretty important subject uh, because we are here in Brooklyn and because we are not very far from the Gowanus Canal, urban sensor uh, hacking it just comes second nature to us. It's first nature to us because that's physically where we are. Uh, the first book started out uh, simply as a way to, uh, our thoughts were that you know we we're both journalists. Emily, particularly, uh, is an environmental journalist, and I was playing with an Arduino, and we were just you know how could this Arduino be used to help journalists, particularly environmental journalists. And we started working on it just to work on it, just to build things that journalists can use. And then we realized there's a book here. Lots more people would like to know about this. We take a look at various uh, different things that can be measured, can be sensed, uh, using an Arduino and various sensors. Sometimes the sensor is as simple as a bare wire. This wire actually measures uh, electromagnetic fields that you wouldn't expect to be around. Uh, we measure uh, sound, measure uh, different sorts of water quality, and we end that first book. Where did it go? I had it right here. Uh, we end the first book with actually measuring radiation wow. with your own... Uh, Geiger counter, and we show you how to get this Geiger counter, put it together, and connect it to an Arduino, which is then connected to a network to allow you to share all this information uh, that you're gathering. Strangely enough, we started writing this book, I think, very end of February 2011, and suddenly there was the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, followed by the, the radiation accident at Fukushima, uh, which you know we immediately said we've got to add another chapter to this book about radiation detection. So these are some of the things you know from something like starting with a very simple bare wire to measure electromagnetic fields, all the way up to a pretty elaborate uh, Geiger counter. All these things from you know, something very cheap like a wire to something relatively expensive like a Geiger counter can be used, can be tied into the Arduino, can be shared on the internet to do urban sensor hacking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I, uh, I got interested in this idea about sort of citizen environmental sensing through various reporting assignments that I did, um, such as uh, uh, for one publication I used to work for, I interviewed um, Natalie Jeremijenko, someone you may have heard of. She's an artist and engineer, and many years ago she had a project called Feral Robot Dogs, where uh, she would work with groups uh, of uh, uh, students uh, and they would take off-the-shelf robotic dogs so and and attach sensors to them and let them loose in a, a, a vacant lot or that they knew was a brownfield um, and a brownfield means that it's a known site of, with some kind of chemical contamination um, and the dogs were also somewhat uh, in a mesh network with each other so that as one dog began to sense something uh, in, in the ground, ground. Uh, it, the, the other dogs, dogs would sort of begin to, to form a pack, and in, in a sense, sense it was revealing something that would otherwise be invisible to human senses. And and, and because, because Natalie is is a very good at this kind of thing, thing also had a, a lot of the theatricality to it. Um, I I have yet to build my own robot sen uh, sensing dog, uh, but 
and I'm not necessarily recommending that that's the first step anyone take in doing urban sensing uh, because it just adds a lot of complexity. But, I mean, I don't think it hurts to think of the theatric, potential theatricality uh, of an urban sensing project um, since part of your goal in this may be to bring attention to a particular condition uh, in, your, in your urban environment. Uh, but first, of course, you have to get your sensors working. Um, and Patrick mentioned the iGeigy project, project. Um, and I actually, uh, well Patrick mentioned Fukushima, and, I'm sorry, and the citizen reporting that some people started to do, uh, my computer is not cooperating, one second please. One uh, thing to but, remember is that uh, when the, the nuclear accident happened after the earthquake and tsunami, uh, almost immediately, it was next to impossible to buy uh, Geiger counter tubes because it was so obvious that the Japanese government and TEPCO were not telling the truth that Japanese hackers went out and just basically bought up the Geiger counter tube market. And it became really difficult to get them because everything was being shipped to Japan to have them set up their own nationwide, essentially, sensor network. Yeah, and so um, sort of reporting I did at that time uh, involved talking with activists. activists. Uh, can, you can you see, see that? that? Yeah, I can see that. It looks great. Uh, who were working together like uh, some activists in Japan and uh, activists from other parts of the world as well were meeting up with, in, had, a, had a sort of hackathon at a, at a hackerspace in Tokyo in the spring of 2011 to come up with an easily uh, distributable uh, Geiger counter type of device because of this problem of the government and the utility being not terribly reliable uh, when it came to distributing information. Um, there was also the simple fact that the tsunami destroyed uh, the sensor network that the utility had been relying on to track radiation levels in the vicinity of that Fukushima nuclear power station. So that that's another, that's sort of another facet, I think, of urban sensing, which is that um, the more people who have good sensors, the more resilient we are against disasters like that that, that might take, take out a particular group of devices. Um, but then perhaps other people can step in with other devices and continue to monitor, uh, uh, you know, curiosity-worthy conditions uh, uh, once the, in the initial disaster has subsided. So this article, by the way, is on um, On Earth's website if you want to look for it. Um, now, now, a Geiger, Geiger, uh, pulling Geiger, Geiger counter, counter reading is a fairly, I mean, is a fairly, is a fairly challenging, challenging task. task. Um, um, we, uh, we, another one of our devices uh, that um, we were really thrilled to, see, now th we were really thrilled to see in action um, was our, one of our water quality detection devices. And I'm trying to get the screen share of that one up now. Uh, this is just a little background, as as uh, Stuart had mentioned. The, the, can anyone hear? Me? I can hear you uh, slightly. I, I I I turned yours down, but you'll have to turn yourself back up because uh, there, there was a uh, increasing we... echo from from Emily's microphone. There we go. Am, yeah, am go I there? Can... You are here. Okay, good. Uh, just as Stuart uh, mentioned in the background, in the, the background, Gowanus Canal. Uh, Gowanus yes, it's a super fun uh, site. Yes, uh, we live in Brooklyn, uh, and so the Gowanus Canal is just well known as uh, a place you don't want to be anywhere near. Uh, it smells. Uh, it's scary. It smells, that that scary. picture that, that you that saw, I have never saw, seen the Gowanus Canal looking blue. <laughs> it generally is. It generally is a sort of toxic green. No matter how you look at it, no that's exactly what it looks like. Exactly so it looks, looks like it's so an incredibly like dangerous an place. Incredibly dangerous and something like March of 2012, we found out that there were people actually starting to uh, use citizen electronics to measure the pollution in the Gowanus. Are you up? 
uh, you know, Google's being its usual persnickety self. I wanted to bring up the next screen, but it, it's not it's not detaching itself from the previous screen. If uh, Emily, if you if you click the if if you go back to our hangout window and you and you click the uh, green screen share button, you should be able to switch uh, into a new window if if that's what the case is here. Um, uh, yes, I, I it is not. Okay. Well, not cooperating. It, meanwhile, uh, I'm curious as as you work on that, uh, Patrick. I'm curious about the Fukushima stuff. Uh, with with the uh, the Geiger counter projects that people are putting together, um, I am curious. I mean, these these appear to be pretty complicated devices, but um, people are working on building their own uh, for these types of applications. You've got the community uh, in, in Japan alone. Uh, it seems like a lot of people rallied behind them. What? How complex is it? A, a Geiger counter project itself. Geiger counters seem like y y you know something from from the atom age. You see them in movies. Uh, they, they they have long handles. They go click 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 click. Uh, really, they are relatively simple devices. What you've got, I'm taking it out right now. What you've got is this tube right here between my fingers. Right. I can hold it this way. This tube is the actual Geiger tube. Now, the old Soviet Union made a gazillion million billion of these things, and when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia just started selling them. So they're available for like $40. You could just buy them, uh, and they're old Soviet Union uh, Geiger tubes. What it is, it's a metal tube that is filled with a gas, and it, it varies, you know, different gases for different models. You build the circuitry, and if you look at it, the circuitry is not that complicated. No, that's pretty basic. You build the circuitry with a 555 chip, which is a very simple timing chip, which puts out a pulse of electricity at certain times, and all of this is just the circuitry to feed the 555. It puts out a pulse of electricity into the tube. Now, normally, you put a pulse of electricity into the tube, and nothing happens. At the moment that a radioactive particle comes through the tube, it completes the circuit uh -huh. between the metal of the tube and the gas within the tube. It's like the only way to complete the circuit is by a radioactive particle going through that tube. When a radioactive particle goes through the tube, it completes the circuit, and just like all the old-fashioned Geiger counters, it goes click. That's great. In this particular case, in this particular case, the notification is this LED right here. Instead of going click, it blinks. The problem is, is that you can see there's a, tra uh, a transformer here, because it's got to up the voltage from a simple 9 volt battery to about 400 volts. Not very dangerous to humans because it's low amperage, but if you connect this directly to your Arduino and you get one thing wrong, you've burned out your Arduino, there's a good chance you've burned out your computer. So what we did, we showed you how to make an opto-isolator, which is basically a tube of plastic. Okay. And the opto-isolator goes over the LED to make a tunnel. Then you get a simple uh, photo sensor on the Arduino. It's as simple as that. You've made sure there's no direct electrical connection between the two. You've made a light connection between the two. So this light goes off in the at one end of this tunnel, yep. and there's a photo sensor at the other end of the tunnel. It detects the light and the Arduino says, you've got to click, you've got, you've detected a particle. Patrick, and now, now, where, where, where in an urban environment might radioactivity be lurking? Everywhere. That's oh. the thing. I was just going to get at that. How do you test this? Well, it turns out, for us, we live in a relatively old building that's got lots of marble and brick. That stuff is very naturally low-level radioactive. 
the, there's a story which says that you could. We've never gotten it to work. But you can take older, excuse me, older smoke detectors, which will also have a small radioactive element in there, uh, and just test it that way by testing the, your Geiger counter up against a smoke detector. I've tried it. I can't guarantee that the increase we saw was due specifically to that. But one of the simplest and strangest ways to detect uh, your, uh, to test your Geiger counter is to go to any hardware store, more precisely a, um, a gardening supply store, and get a bag of fertilizer that has a very high potassium content. Interesting. All, all potassium is naturally very, very slightly radioactive. When you get a big fertilizer bag with of potassium, it's going to be more radioactive than the background radiation, and you can test your Geiger counter that way. Uh, those are the places where you naturally find radiation. New York City happens to be about, I believe they kept saying, 40 or 45 miles from Indian Point Nuclear Power Station. If Fukushima had happened here at Indian Point, or, to look at it another way, if Hurricane Sandy last year had been a little more powerful and had gone further up the Hudson, we might have had a problem in Indian Point, which would have irradiated the whole area. So we're generally in, in a city you hope to only detect background radiation with your Geiger counter. You, um, you hope not to detect much of anything else. Uh, so Emily the has you gotten? Yeah. I'm, okay. Yeah. So so uh, I, I've just gotten a note that uh, Emily's attempting to come back in, uh, but uh, it seems that she's been blocked by Patrick. So. Oh well, how do we do that? <laughs> uh, and I don't know how to undo that. Craig, do you know uh, to unblock someone? Is it is there a quick click that they can do? Uh, he did it uh, internally just to for for audio. Well, either way, if she wants to jump in and sit side by side, that will work just fine as well. Uh, and and we can because I know that it, it might it might appear that they're miles and miles apart in different rooms, but uh, actually, uh, Patrick and Emily are inside the same building at this moment. So uh, we can we can solve this problem just by having them uh, share one computer, and that will work just fine. Okay. Um, Hopefully not yeah. too radioactive. Yeah. <laughs> the um. Patrick, yeah, I've heard Patrick. I I um. I happen to re know from where I used to live in the New York area that um. There's also some ra uh, radioactive contamination over in New Jersey from uh, old watch manufacturing companies, particularly in the. Uh, the least surprised. Yeah. I wouldn't be the least surprised at that. Uh, we live in New York, so um. We're we're inclined to think just about everything in New Jersey is contaminated, but. That's just prejudice on our part. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to find um, you know, old watch places, uh, old um, medical uh, device um, or, or testing places would be contaminated, sure, with, radio, with radioactivity, absolutely. And since the, the Fukushima disaster, uh, have some of these uh, groups that have assembled their own uh, Geiger counters and put together these networks, have they noticed a distinct increases in radiation? And is it something that's noticeable beyond just the immediate region? Is this something that, that uh, hold, has... Hold, has... Hold, hold that thought for one moment. Can you hear any of this? Okay. What we're going to do is disconnect so we can hear you. Yeah. This is okay. just fine. Ah, okay. That's fine, right. uh, and I think I think you would be better able to handle this question that he's about to continue to ask. Okay. Hello again, Emily. Hi again. So as uh, as I was just uh, as I was just asking, since the. Uh, the, the groups have started assembling, the Jap these Japanese hack, uh, hacker spaces and maker spaces have started assembling their own Geiger counters. Uh, have they detected uh, their own unique 
uh, or distinct levels of radiation differing from that of what the officials have declared, and and has has have those extended beyond just the uh, the regions immediately surrounding where the uh, the tsunami struck. Those those are good. Those, I guess I can take this off. Um, those are good questions. Uh, I don't have answers to all of them. Um, <clears throat> For one thing, the um, you know that area right around the plant is is a, uh, a frozen zone now. Uh, just about everyone, everyone, well, not just about. It's been evacuated uh, because there's so much ground contamination, and um, it's really not clear at all if or when any of those people will ever be able to move back into their homes. So it's really been a major disaster. What? So uh, I think. Uh, I, I doubt, I would be very surprised and I wouldn't recommend that any citizen hacker scientists be going into the Fukushima frozen zone to monitor radiation. But what I, what I think people wanted to do was see if they could detect uh, changing levels of radiation further away from the plant because, again, at the time, there was very little information being given out by the Japanese government, which simply, I think, didn't know for a while, but wasn't simply saying that. Um, and then also, some of the uh, Americans who were involved with that project were very concerned. You know, they, they live in Portland, and they, they began wondering, is any of this going to make it across the Pacific and, and hit, hit us? Would we have to be worried? And um, you know the 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 governments, our government, simply saying, eh, no, it's unlikely. That didn't really soothe them. You know, that's not that. Like I think that quote that we started with, where if you um, if you can't measure it, you can't fix it, is I mean that's really profound because you know. Um, and and then the, because the next question is, if the people who should be measuring it aren't or aren't telling you, you know, how do you know what to do next? Um, and what I, I, as far as I know, between those um, sort of hacker uh, radiation detection people and some other sensors that just had people had running before the accident happened, I believe they did, people were detecting some different levels of radiation from what might have been considered the norm in the wake of, of Fukushima. Now, it must be said, however, that you do not necessarily need a uh, Geiger counter to do that. Uh, what, what people in Tokyo were doing, for instance, were they were simply wearing badges. And the badge would change color if the radiation level got to a certain point where you needed to begin thinking about whether you wanted to be where you were. Um, so uh, that sort of speaks to the need of like, why am I doing this? Um, like, and if, if your goal is, I, I just want to know when to get the hell out of here. I mean, a simple badge might save you a lot of time and effort. I mean, aside from the joy of building yourself, which is something completely different. But where I think devices like ours really excel is in if you if you feel like you want to be tracking something over time because you've got to develop a baseline in order for your data to have any meaning um, if you simply start up your radiation detector one day and it, it pings five times um, that could be like coming from the marble that is a uh, in the you know in the trim work in your hallway, it could be coming from the bricks. There are so radiation is a natural phenomenon. What you need to do is you need to sort of keep that thing going, or at the very least say, okay, I'm home from work by 8 p.m. every night at nine o'clock. I'm going to turn on the radiation detector for an hour, and you have to start to build up a body of data, or else you just don't know. You know, you don't really, you're, you have no basis for comparison between what was and, and what is. If we could uh, change the, uh, yeah, keep on that topic, but change the thing being measured, uh, we've got a fantastic resource uh, for that. And I'm going to go into screen share. And that's not it. 
So I'm going to go into screen share this way. And that's not it. But now we're going to try one last thing. We're going to go into screen share this way. It's not showing. Here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to show this, which is where we used the gadget in atmospheric monitoring with Arduino, which was a simple gas sensor that we simply placed on the outside window ledge and measured at different times to see how the pollution, this is a, a, a hydrocarbon pollution chart, we're going to see how it changes. Are you seeing this? I, yes. I am. This is really interesting. Okay. Uh, it's a hydrocarbon residue pollution chart uh, that we just did, as you see, August 8th of last year. And you can see that the blue lines are how we measured the atmospheric pollution in the morning, which is around 10 o'clock in the morning. And at the bottom, uh, it's every six minutes we took a reading. And you see that it's relatively low. We then took the machine back in, uh, recharged the battery, and put it back out in time for the evening rush hour. And you can see the evening is orange. And look at the immense difference between mid-morning, when the, you know, the traffic was normal, compared to the evening rush hour. Absolutely. In, in some cases, the pollution is much, much higher. Uh, as you might expect from evening rush hour. Now, something like this. It's a simple, simple gadget with the Arduino, a gas sensor, and we used a transistor to turn it on and off, to turn the power to the gas sensor on and off. Yeah, just to, to make sure we regulated the power better. And how do I shut this off now? You should just be able to click on the screen share button there you go um, there so, you are yeah that's so so and and the gas sensor for this where did you find a gas sensor that you could use for a project like this uh, that just about any sort well it might even be in the sensor uh, hacking kit that you have uh, would you grab a gas sensor they should be labeled actually uh, they are small devices they're about the size of your thumb and Emily's going into the into the component drawers to get one of them and what it does, it's uh, tin dioxide, which, uh, just grab, there you go, perfect. It is, there you go, about the size of the tip of your thumb, really. It's tin dioxide on the inside. Tin dioxide is a highly reactive metal, relatively reactive. And as... Uh, you, you hold it up uh, into the air, and as little bits of hydrocarbon residue land on the tin dioxide, it changes the resistance of that uh, tin dioxide metal, and your Arduino is simply measuring the change in resistance. That's basically, if we can get down to basics, that is basically what nearly every electronic sensor is, from a thermistor to measure the temperature, from a water sensor, uh, uh, a sensor to measure the pollution in water, all the way up to a gas sensor, um, it measures the change in resistance of a substance uh, when it's exposed to whatever you're measuring. In this case, who, who's whistling? Is that us? It's not on your end. Okay. No. Uh, basically, from that, uh, it's it's this simple little gas sensor. Uh, it's measuring the change in resistance. As we <laughs> said, you stick it out the window, and you measure the um, change in hydrocarbon pollution from morning to afternoon. How is this useful? It's extremely useful if your city government doesn't do these measurements. If your city government is telling you that your neighborhood doesn't really have a pollution problem, what you need to do is then show them this version of the chart you made. Whoops, I'm not in uh, I'm not in full screen mode. You show them this version of the chart that you had made, 
showing that there is an enormous difference between early morning and rush hour pollution. Yeah. So little things like this sensor, which retails for about six dollars, seven dollars, depending on where you buy them, um, and an Arduino and a separate battery pack can provide you with an awful lot of information. Yeah. When you get more than one person doing this, when you get everyone, not everyone, but uh, at least one person on each block in your neighborhood doing something like this, you've got a real potent data set that if you're, if you're doing urban hacking and your city government is not responsive, you've got an enormous amount of data that you can take to them or take to the media. Now, do you know of any communities, are, are there any groups that are actually doing this exact type of, of measurement, a block-by-block -block survey? With gas, you know, t testing the atmosphere? Is that what you meant? Is that what uh, I mean, yes. Not, not that I'm aware of. It's, it's really hard to get everyone to do it block-by-block. Um, and especially here in New York, New York is very, very proactive in its neighborhood sensing. Um, so, you know, if we were to go to our local councilman and say that, you know, we've got a, a pollution problem, he probably already knows that. So we're very lucky uh, in New York, but other places might not be so lucky. Well, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um Projects that people might want to look into if um, if they want to see whether people are organizing this kind of um, community uh, uh, air pollution monitoring. One is called Air Quality Egg, which um, was developed uh, by a hacker group here in New York and then thrown open to the internet for improvements. I think uh, I think they did a Kickstarter last year in order to raise money and set it up in, in, in multiple cities around the world. So checking in on the progress of that, you might find some people uh, doing this sort of thing. And there's also a project, I think it's called Smart City Barcelona, Okay. that was uh, saying they were going to do something like this. I don't know if they actually did. But yes, those are Emily, they will be a speaker later on in this in this. Oh, there you go then. Yeah, so check into what those two Binary explosion and yet no air monitoring system in place. Who was that? Well, that was interesting. Uh, I, I don't know where that one came from. So... One of the uh, one of the ones that I'm familiar with, and Patrick, you and I mentioned this uh, just for a moment uh, yeah, earlier. As excuse us for one second. Excuse go us ahead. one second. You you talk about something else. We we're going to get up the Gowanus slideshow here. Oh great. Okay. Ma Fantastic. Mike, Mike, I might I might point out for those uh, listen those watching who are in the Bay Area. There's a really interesting situation in uh, Richmond. Um, in the Bay Area, where uh, during a recent Chevron fire, um, in which uh, residents were told to go into their houses, close their doors and windows, and not go outside, um, it turns out that officially there was no perceived air quality monitoring problem because the actual monitoring sites for uh, the city were in a different wind direction than the direction that the that the fire was moving from the wind. Um, and I know that there's some interest in setting up a community um, air monitoring uh, group in the Richmond area. That's great, yeah. And that's uh, really not far from, uh, from where I live, so that's something that I actually will look into further. It'd be nice to participate in that. OK, can you see the slideshow that we've started? Yes. I can. Yes. Okay. Would you like this? This was going yeah. to be your big sure. thing. Okay. Okay. And uh, this talks about uh, a a water sensor that we built, a water pollution sensor that we built in. What did you just do? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, in environmental monitoring with Arduino, uh, which we found out totally by accident was being used by someone else. So, yeah. Emily, if you could. Yeah. So, yeah, that was it. Was a very elegant for you to bring up um, 
the Gowanus Canal right there in the introduction because um, last year uh, there was a water hackathon in New York. It was sponsored in part by uh, the Public Lab Group, which does a lot of um, citizen science. And, uh, they're very well known for doing grassroots mapping projects. And they, uh, they had this hackathon all weekend long to, to get uh, people to work on uh, water sensing devices. And uh, we went to the Gowanus Canal that Sunday to watch, uh, watch uh, uh, devices being tested. Hey, and Emily, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just yeah. wanted to ask, your screen, uh, the slideshow appears to be giving us a, a flickering effect on our end. I'm not sure if it's something that you're seeing uh, no, as well, but... Um, to take it, it out of full screen. Yeah, hold on a sec, and we'll, yeah, we'll make it small. Okay. Does this help? Yes. Yeah, that's much better. Now we can see the image and okay. no, more, no, no more strobing effect. Much All right. better. Thank you. So, um, yeah, you can see here that the... Um, you know, uh, there's a group, there's, a, there's an activist group called the Gowanus Dredgers that, uh, that uh, is doing its best to care for and upgrade the condition of the canal. And so they were working with this um, other organization which came up, came up with this water quality sensor based on the design in environmental monitoring with Arduino. Um, do you bring it back? I want to bring it back, yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the things we were really thrilled about here was that um, um, this activist uh, slash hacker, Leif Percival, had come up with a really great enclosure for the gadget. Um, uh, you can see here, and he's pointing at it, uh, you have the Arduino, uh, a shield that he built himself, uh, a power source, um, and a whole bunch more. Uh, in a very sturdy pelican case that they had then drilled uh, some holes in and gummed up with, you know, like marine glue or something in order to uh, be able to dangle the uh, wires into the water. And um, one, uh, this, this is the sensing end of the gadget, and this really thrilled us too because we had kind of come up with this home-crafted probe solution that they improved on really well by simply using um, uh, what are these things called again? Terminal terminal clip terminals, uh, spade terminals, and um, they're much sturdier. And they they got a crucial aspect of the device, which is that the that the probe the the, the ends of the probe need to remain a um, consistent distance apart. Uh, because what they're actually doing is they're they're uh, passing an electric current between them to detect particles in the water, and the goal of this adaptation of our gadget uh, was to detect when combined sewer overflows were entering the Gowanus Canal. Uh, on top of all the other gunk in the canal. The canal has sewer outflows, which are in every New York waterway when it rains and uh, the, the, the volume in the sewer system gets too big for the existing plants to handle. Uh, uh, whatever's in the sewers begins to get dumped into the local waterways and that includes sewage. So, so rainwater, sewage, whatever's been washing off the streets and um, what Leaf's idea was was that when um, when there was a combined sewer outflow, the device would detect the higher particulate count, and then I believe it tweeted. Uh, I believe it tried. It sent a tweet uh, uh, to uh, saying something like, um, um, "Don't flush." Uh, go on. Don't flush Brooklyn. Uh, oh, come sewer overflow in the Gowanus Canal. So, um, uh, can you advance the slide? Wait, uh, do you see the slideshow? At this point, no. I'm back to you guys. But okay. that that Twitter account, that's pretty clever. And uh, but yeah. yeah, not 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 that it's it's that this is supposed to be a comical thing, but uh, it is that is. Uh, I think it helps to take a heavy subject and and find some ways to make it a little lighter. And that actually ran for a while, uh, from what we understand from Leaf, until there was a huge flood. 
service. <laughs> so essentially, what it is is, and we we've gussied this up a bit. It is the H two O conductivity tester, which we've put into a nice Adafruit case. Very nice. With a nice uh, liquid crystal display and its own separate power supply. So we'll power this up. And can you see it? Testing. Yep. And we've got a we got a readout. When we put this, whoops, when we put these uh, probes into the water, uh, it measures the resistance of this gap of water in between the two electrodes. By measuring the resistance, and if you remember, we said basically every uh, sensor out there pretty much measures resistance, uh, measures the resistance of the water or precisely the conductivity of the water, and I just broke the power supply, <laughs> so I can't show you how it works because the power supply is broken. Yeah, but when it does work, what it does is it displays on top here the voltage that is measured, the resistance, the conductivity, and using EPA uh, formulas, it calculates the total dissolved solids in the water. Now, obviously, pure water, you want to have very few dissolved particles. Uh, much more polluted water will have lots more dissolved particles in that water. Right. Uh, when we went to visit this group that was, you know, installing these water testers, we were absolutely amazed to find that they were using, you know, essentially our supply, uh, our, our gadget. Uh, they reached into their book, uh, they reached into their bag, rather, and pulled out the environmental monitoring book. Uh, so we knew that they had actually based this on what we had put into our book, but they simply just expanded on it. They made it solar powered. They added a GSM modem so that when uh, you know various when it measured you know various uh, conditions in the Gowanus Canal, it would tweet those conditions. You know how how bad or how good things were in the canal at that moment. Well, that's just fantastic. That's that's very cool. Yeah, it was loads of fun, and and you know we're we're there saying you know, that looks like our project that that they're using, and in fact it it was uh, only you know much more expanded. Yeah, very cool. So, let's say uh, there's uh, one of the viewers that's watching right now. They want to start measuring something. What would you say the first thing that they should do to jump up and and start uh, getting involved with sensors would be? The easiest one. The easiest thing to do is to measure uh, electromagnetic radiation. Basically what you're doing is you're turning your Arduino into a radio receiver, uh, but not one like, you know, that's limited to AM or FM or shortwave or whatever. This thing will pick up almost anything as long as you've got the right antenna for it. And the antenna is nothing more than a piece of wire. It's great. You use that piece of wire and just walk around your office, your house, your neighborhood to find out where the biggest electromagnetic uh, fields are. Uh, for example, in our office, uh, you know, we built this gadget and we took it around the office, and we found that there was a. Have you heard of the term vampire loads? Which I have. Is, which is electronic devices that still remain on even though you shut them off. We took this around the office and we found a vampire load we didn't even have. Well, we didn't know we had. We found a gadget that we thought was completely off and was still using electricity by simply building this electromagnetic sensor. It's the simplest one because the sensor consists of nothing more than a piece of wire. That's great. Uh, that, that, yeah, that sounds, that sounds uh, like a, a really easy way to, to get started with some of this. And then obviously, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about um, expanding these, these into 
uh, networks that people can then, you know, I, I love the idea of, of, of seeing a community building a block by block air sensing uh, grid. I mean, I think that would be a fascinating project. Um, now, there's a question. One of one of the one of the commenters here, Bradley Chapman, he's asking how uh, we could apply uh, these sensors and the stuff that you guys are working on to K to uh, K12 education. And if there's a book in the works for teachers about uh, building Arduino into life and Earth science curriculum, is this something you guys are familiar with? I'm not necessarily familiar with the the curriculum. Uh, we had always see the thing is this book is so simple. And uh, the books that we have uh, include uh, an electronics primer at the very beginning. So we, we deliberately made this. As I said, if you remember when we started talking, we said we were doing this for uh, environmental journalists, you know, to build some gadgets. Right. You can trust environmental journalists not to be the most hacker-licious type of people. <laughs> So, and that's not, you know, there are very few people who really understand how to build things. Here in our little maker bubble, we're so used to, uh, you know, meeting and knowing other makers, we forget that a lot of people out there don't know how to use this. So right. we wrote these books specifically for those people. Uh, none of the things in the books uh, require soldering. So you don't need to know how to solder. Um, the code is all there. So really, I think if you've got the basic knowledge of, you know, even how to learn, you could take these books and if you're, you know, teaching third grade, you can find something like the electromagnetic sensor, which is very, very simple, might work for third graders. If you're teaching a higher grade, that's where you go to uh, build the, the uh, Geiger counter and the radiation detector, which is much more complicated. Yeah. And also, I mean, I think although there's no curriculum component to our books, um, which we have been told since is, is something that a lot of school systems want, is a formal teaching curriculum-like guide. Um, if you... There, there, there are probably guides out there, and I've even seen a few, for like electronics curriculum, for like, uh, you know, shop classes or engineering classes. Right. And I, I should think that, and then there's also programming curricula, which I know exists because my, my niece, who is uh, a teenager, like knew more about programming by the time she graduated high school than I learned uh, over you know, five or ten years of, of, of being a web producer. Um, it amazed me. And I, sh I, I would think that, like, with those curricula in hand, you could then introduce projects such as the ones we have in this book because they are about building circuits, they're about testing components, and then with when you bring the Arduino in, it's about uh, learning a fairly basic programming language called programming. Right. So those might be ways in which you could begin to bring sensing devices into your curriculum. Who do you guys look to when you're when 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 you're working on new projects and researching things? Who are you finding that are really uh, working on interesting things themselves that you get impressed by? You or me? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, lately, um, what I'm really interested in are soft circuits and uh, the notion of whether we could begin to integrate sensors into things like uh, clothing and accessories and bags. And part of this, frankly, is because uh, I am a very avid knitter. Ah. <laughs> and um, um, my knitting skills really are better than my electronic skills, although, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll bring them all up to <laughs> stuff one day. And I would like to find ways to, uh, you know, begin to sort of use the, the incredible wealth of, of soft circuit stuff that's out there now uh, in knitting projects. Um, and, and not only to get, um, you know, knitters more interested in, in doing smart smart projects, but then also hopefully to get, uh, you know, 
uh, textile people and electronics people in the hacker and maker worlds talking more with each other because there's it's a pretty it seems like it's a pretty small group right now. So I uh, I keep an eye on um, you know Adafruit, which has some really great. Uh, weekly or monthly videos where they look at uh, soft circuit, the latest components and different kinds of projects that people can do. Um, I'm really quite inspired by some of the stuff I'm seeing going on there. Yeah, that's a that's a great a great group. We're really working on some fascinating uh, projects and products too. And the wearables. I mean, that's that's one of the things that where the whole notion of sensors really can expand because at this point we're getting to such a mobile state and why not have these uh, th these types of sensors embedded right into our apparel. Um, yeah, and exactly. And I mean there are some end products coming out now like uh, people are trying to popularize like little sensor kits that you could plug right into your iPhone and I mean, there's a lot to be said for that because the iPhone is a very powerful computer or an Android phone. Uh, why not try to take advantage of that? But I, I, I don't, I'd like to see it become more invisible than that. I'd like to see it like not even that you have to pull your phone out of your bag and, and pop something into it and start to you know wave it around like a Star Trek tricorder. I, I'd really like to just have a scarf around my neck that's gathering data. You know, um, um, and uh, you know, I, I, it's it's a challenge. I think about it a lot. I have a lot of little scribbles in a notebook about, about how I may actually go about trying to make some of these things. Great. Well, I'm excited to see uh, see what what those scribbles lead to because you guys are really working on uh, some cool stuff, and the the books that you guys have have put uh, out are. Uh, I mean, they're they're fantastic, and a lot of great projects and information and um, stuff that uh, I think are is, is interesting for for all ages and all uh, all communities and uh, and groups. Um, environmental monitoring with Arduino and atmospheric monitoring with Arduino, uh, two great titles. Uh, Stuart, do you simple uh, and basic? I, yeah. Yeah, I, I just uh, I had uh, Patrick actually going back to uh, you, you really got me curious when you talked about people wearing badges um, that you know showed uh, radiation and that reminded yeah, me, that reminded me of um, you know nurses and people in dentist offices who uh, who are around X-ray machines. Um, is there any is there any um, collection of Badges that do this kind of thing along the lines of what Emily was saying, where you could sort of have them pinned onto your clothing or stitched into your clothing, other than radiation. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, like for hydrocarbons? Yeah, I don't know. We don't know. Um, radiation works so fast. Yeah. <laughs> that it's you know that the badge approach works really well for radiation. Before these things were invented, this is a gas sensor. Before these things were invented, the best realistically the only way to measure particulates in the atmosphere was through a process called paper chromatography, in which case you you would you would get a piece of filter paper very much like a coffee filter. Uh, in fact, uh, you could use a coffee filter to do uh, uh, paper chromatography experiments. Uh, and you'd put it out in the air and let it capture what it captured. And then you would stain it with various chemicals. So I would, I, I'm just guessing at this, but I wouldn't be surprised if you could take pieces of filter paper, pre stain it with various chemicals, and then when you walk into a highly polluted uh, a atmosphere, watch it change color before you die. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on how polluted it is. Right. You yeah. can name that project Canary in the Coal Mine. Yeah. <laughs> basically. Basically, yes. Yeah. Robot Canary. <laughs> Paper Canary. Paper yeah. Canary. <laughs> well, well guys. Systems coming up. There are, uh, there's one question from, from Harry O. Uh, who's asking, are Arduino, Raspberry, Propeller, which of these are being used? In our projects, we were uh, we limited ourselves strictly to the Arduino, uh, possibly possibly uh, mostly because 
when we started these books, the Raspberry Pi had not yet come out. So uh, that, that, that's how that works. Uh, the propeller uh, probably is too bare for us, uh, and, and the propeller development board is much more expensive than an Arduino. So, you know, uh, these sensors require very, very little computer processing. They require some, but not a lot. And the Arduino can definitely handle it. So why go to a more powerful computer or microprocessor that's more expensive and you don't really need? But with uh, with Raspberry Pi having come out after you uh, put uh, these these two titles out, are there things with it that you're interested in testing out with some of the sensor projects you're working on? See, the thing is, again. The Raspberry Pi is such a powerful computer. It's a full-fledged computer. Absolutely. Rather than being a microprocessor. And pretty much all of these sensors, like the gas sensor, the water sensor, even the Geiger counter, you don't need that level of computing to do gas, water, sound, electromagnetic sensing. There's nothing stopping you from taking a big, powerful Raspberry Pi and doing gas sensing with it, but it's certainly overkill. You don't need that level of computing to do the basic level of sensing. Yeah, and that's one of the great things. Uh, you know, all of them are uh, very capable boards, uh, but the the Arduino. Uh, you know the, the community, the libraries that exist for it, and and the simplicity of it really have helped exactly. make it a really stand out uh, for yeah. for these types of projects. As we said, there's nothing stopping you from using a Raspberry Pi, but you know it's it's overkill, and and you don't need that much power to do simple environmental sensing. Absolutely. Well, guys, I really appreciate your. Uh, you're taking some time to chat with us and uh, and, and run through the, the projects you guys have worked on. Um, Thank you. you know, again, fantastic uh, series of books and um, some some really interesting examples. Uh, everyone that's interested in uh, looking forward at things that they can do uh, along the lines of what Patrick and Emily are working on. Again, uh, the atmospheric uh, monitoring with Arduino and the environmental monitoring with Arduino. Uh, two great books from. Uh, Maker Press, and um, for those of you guys who want to jump in and really start working on uh, some some of these sensing projects yourself, uh, again we've got uh, we've got a, a great uh, selection of sensors and projects uh, and components that we're sending out for uh, people who sign up for our Urban Sensor Hack uh, participant list. If uh, if you're interested in participating, go to makezine.com slash urban hyphen sensor hyphen hack and register uh, there's a, a whole selection of goodies that we're sending out uh, wireless sensing lab workshop kit uh, from kip kits ultimate microcontroller pack from make uh, a whole group of books uh, that dive right into all of these uh, including uh, Patrick and Emily's uh, books as well and um, Possibly uh, the sensor pack 900 from Adafruit, but that one is going out to the first responder. So if you don't uh, get signed up, there's a few slots left. Uh, you might miss out on getting that one. Um, but uh, this will be running for the next few weeks, uh, Urban Sensor Hacks, and uh, we'll have continued hangouts on air every Tuesday and Thursday uh, at the same time. 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Uh, on the East Coast. And we've got a whole selection of additional uh, masters and sensors uh, that will continue to share these uh, fantastic stories, examples, projects, and so forth with all of you guys. So uh, make sure to mark it on your calendar. Keep watching. Go to our Google Plus page. Tell us about projects you're working on and, uh, and share photos, ask questions. We'll be happy to dive in and try to help answer anything that comes up and uh, and and get involved. But uh, for now, thank you again. Thank you, uh, Stuart. Any last things to say? Thanks a lot, Emily and Patrick. It was really it was really a pleasure to hear what about your projects. Yeah. And uh, for everyone else out there, we'll see you next week. 
thanks again. Have a good weekend, and um, keep the projects up. All right. Take care, guys. We're, we're, we're saying goodbye?